you have gotten tuberculosis to come back into the great cities of the United States, for example. We have, at any one time, about 20-some patients in this hospital with tuberculosis. If your eyesight is good and you know where to look, you can watch Darwin's principles in action. Bugs, particularly the bugs that we have in our intestine, they divide every 30 minutes. Bugs are very promiscuous. We may be in a promiscuous era for, for adults but, and for children, but let me tell you, bugs have been promiscuous from time immemorial. A enterococcus doesn't feel that it makes any difference whether it mates with a group A strep or with a pneumococcus or with a staph or some other organism like that. It is totally impervious. It has no character whatsoever. In Dr. New's lab at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, dishes filled with a bacteria-infested culture are used to study how organisms change. Once the bacteria are well-established and breeding away, dots of antibiotics are introduced. The circle around each dot is a dead zone. The bigger the circle, the more bacteria have been killed, the more effective the drug. But of the many millions of individual bacteria in the colony, a tiny fraction will be naturally resistant to the drug. When their rivals die, the survivors quickly take over. Virtually all staphylococci in the world in 1941 were susceptible to penicillin. By 1944, although very little penicillin had been used in a hospital, what had happened is 25% had become resistant. By 47, when one started to use penicillin extensively in hospitals to treat pneumococcal pneumonia, to treat severe infections, what had happened, we were up to 75% resistance. Those organisms now would not be killed by penicillin. So discoveries that were hailed only a few years ago as miracle drugs have not been the permanent panaceas we thought they'd be. It's Darwinian theory at its best. And this organism can only be killed by a couple antibiotics. And I will tell you that if I used this one that's inhibiting it at the present time, in a week it will be resistant to that, it will be resistant to that, and resistant to that in a week. In a week. That's why diseases we thought we had conquered, like malaria and tuberculosis, are coming back, leapfrogging over our efforts to stay ahead of them. It does turn out, again, that many bacteria become resistant to penicillin, and we can follow the changes. In the case of um, malaria, which is also becoming a very ser serious uh, disease again, it's partly that the malarial parasite has changed. It's also, of course, that malaria is, is transmitted by, um, by mosquitoes, and the mosquitoes have changed. I mean, we used to be able to kill the mosquitoes with insecticide, and now we can't. So it's both the mosquito and, and the malaria are changing. We're, we're creating trouble for ourselves. I mean, if you go into my greenhouse, you'll find there are white fly in there. Now, they, you cannot kill those white fly with any insecticide that you can buy from the garden shop down the road. Uh, though 20 years ago, you would have been able to. Those white fly have evolved a resistance to insecticide. What we are seeing in the microscope and in the headlines is natural selection at work. There's a step-by-step -step escalation exactly like the arms race between, say, Russia and America. Each step on one side is countered by a counter step on the other, and that's answered by a counter counter step on the first side and so on. No, it is a continuous little race going on between predators and their prey, diseases and their hosts and so on. Constantly happening. Unlike bacteria and viruses, which can mutate and adapt with astonishing speed, man cannot. Humans change so slowly that over 95% of our genetic makeup dates back to the Stone Age. That impacts on our emotions and our reactions to stress. That there is perhaps a mismatch between the way we have evolved, between, if you like, the equipment that our evolutionary ancestry has given us, 
and the way we now use that equipment, our basic physiology, in everyday life. I mean, we were not evolved in order to sit in motor cars and drive around at 70 or 80 miles an hour. We were not equipped by evolution to spend most of our working lives uh, sedentary, uh, sitting at desks as many of us do and pushing pieces of paper around. It's, you only have to say these things to realize that we're living in a human environment now, largely, an environment of our own making. A new field called Darwinian medicine is an attempt to understand how traits we have picked up through hundreds of thousands of years of evolution are at work today. We may be doing things which sometimes are so different from the way uh, things were when we evolved that we set up some tensions. A classic example that's often used would be um, we are equipped to respond to emergency situations with what uh, Walter Cannon called the fight or flight response, which, you know, adrenaline pumping round, blood sugar raised, and so on. There used to be a point to it all. Adrenaline speeds up reaction time. Increased blood sugar gives us instant energy. Blood is diverted to the muscles, and we're ready to fight nature's marauders. And all we're facing is another parking ticket. Darwinian medicine also has an answer, or an excuse, perhaps for those worried about their weight. Lots of people have tried to understand why we have the epidemic of heart disease that we have now, and for that matter, the epidemic of cancer as well, partly caused by the amount of fat in our diet. We've all been educated ad nauseum to quit eating so much fat, quit eating so much salt, quit eating so much sugar, and we all keep doing it. Well, the selective disadvantage of eating too little might be that you might starve when the next famine comes by. Therefore, a few extra pounds that are going to get you through that period will be quite advantageous. So it's not surprising that in the brain, mechanisms have been shaped that ensure that when adequate food is available, we tend to eat a little too much rather than a little too little. There are some less obvious examples of evolved defenses that are more important medically. For example, some infectious bacteria need iron to grow. People with chronic disease sometimes are found to have low iron levels. And some physicians who don't know about this defense are liable to give those patients iron, when in fact the body has a very complex evolved mechanism for taking a lot of the iron that's free in the circulation and quickly storing it in the liver so it's not available to bacteria. Certainly our knowledge can't affect our genetics in, in any direct way, um, but our knowledge about how these mechanisms work can be very useful to us. More controversial, our attempts to apply Darwinian laws to human behavior. Some of our, perhaps, behavioral responses uh, that are highly aggressive under certain circumstances may be behavioral responses that we share with chimpanzees and gorillas. Some scientists contend an evolutionary understanding may go a long way toward explaining the advantages of certain behaviors we see in the world today. The field is called sociobiology. Males of many species exhibit aggressiveness, competitiveness, jealousy, and the skills that help their ancestors survive. That might explain the warlike behavior of members of the human species. If we like someone's bright eyes, glossy hair, white teeth, it's because we're programmed to look for a healthy partner, often much like ourselves, to help ensure that our lineage will survive in all this, are we so different from other species? Our actions say, I'm quick and healthy, sexually mature, and my genes deserve to be passed along. Is this a holdover from the dawn of man? Are we all driven by biological imperatives? Highly unlikely, say the many critics of Darwinian psychology. The part played in our lives by inherited behavior is minuscule compared with the effects of real life experience. And they say the idea that our behavior is pre-programmed plays into the hands of those who say that the inequalities of our society are inevitable. The debate goes on. Still, 150 years later, Darwin continues to be a key in telling us about ourselves and our history. Dancing across the screen are triplets of letters, the language of life, those T's and G's and A's and C's spell out genes, the basic building blocks of heredity. Scientists are using this newest of the sciences to answer some of the oldest questions. 
and the gleaming glassware and the glowing computer screens are confirming a lot of what Darwin suspected all along.